Welcome everyone to Mailfuzz TV, I am Peter and today I'm going to be talking about The Last of Us Season 1 Episode 2. It's called Infected, so full spoilers for the episode, uh, but not for the game. Uh, if I have spoilers for the game that I want to talk about, I'll do that at the end and give you a second spoiler warning. I don't think there is, but just in case. So, this episode, what's really been fascinating watching this, just two episodes in, is just kind of seeing like what chunk of the game that we're getting. Obviously the stuff that's been added, there seems to be a structure that's emerging where the opening of each episode is some kind of flashback uh, to build up the greater world that The Last of Us is in. Last episode it was the, the talk show from the 60s. This episode it's sort of the scientist in Jakarta being taken to sort of examine one of the early cases of the spread of the infection. Um, and that sells some of the the doom to come. And then obviously there's a lot of character stuff here, and it primarily is the uh, the journey to the Capitol building, going through the museum. Um, it condenses some things from the game, of course. Uh, and this is something I said last time, but of course, you know, in a video game, you do repeat encounters. You do encounters of regular infected, then clickers, and then you do a mix of both, then you do them all a lot, because it's a video game and you want to play it and... You want to mix and match and up the, the difficulty for the player. TV, film's a bit different. You want to uh, make them feel more special. You want to want it to feel like you're constantly doing the same thing. And you build up to the, the big moments, right? And that's what this episode does, is that it, it builds up to our first proper look at the clickers, how scary they are, the mechanic of them being blind and the sound and trying to be quiet is a big part of get, getting around them. Um, that section of the episode is phenomenal, honestly. Like I was, <laughs> like it was, it was expert. There was, there's that moment where Joel's ran away from a clicker and he, he knocks over something because the idea that you can kind of like distract them again by like making a noise. So maybe if you throw something in the other part of the room, they'll start to look in that direction for a bit. But he's reloading his gun as quiet as he can, and the camera, like, you can see the clicker to the left, you know, in the background, but then the camera goes in closer to Joel. And as soon as it did that, and he's sort of, like, in close, and he's just, he's finishing reloading his gun, I'm like, oh god, the camera's going to pull back again, and the clicker is going to be much closer. Which is not even that unique a trick, like, you know, the, the, the you know, it's Ninja Cat, it, it's closer <laughs> when you look again. But the way it did it, and that sort of realization that Joel kind of realizes that the audience, much like the audience has already suspected that the clicker is going to be closer, Joel hears a click and immediately he's like, oh shit, it's closer. You can see that reaction on his face. So it works in the context of it expects the audience to predict it because then the the moment, the joke, joke's maybe not the right word, but it's almost a joke that he's realized it and like he's sort of like oh it's clicked for him no pun intended <laughs> so um yeah that entire you know horror section of them sneaking through the museum obviously is the big set piece of the episode it is the thing that's probably going to have the most people talking for this episode uh, the clickers look fantastic they look right out of the game and uh, i love the build to it where they've not really talked about clickers in front of ellie and immediately like they're like whispering they're saying don't be don't make any noise and from this point on we're going to be silent not quiet we're going to be silent and ellie doesn't know why and what's so good about this is that early in the episode and to an extent in the first episode we heard it on like the radio or something in the first episode but ellie earlier on when they're walking across the highway in the city she says oh the city's a lot quieter than i thought it would be you know like all the stories like all the rumors and fear-mongering Presumably, maybe to keep all the kids from going outside, because it is, it is legitimately dangerous, but the rumours have made it sound even more extreme in that she was expecting her just to be infected and, you know, running around everywhere. And it's actually like, you know, they walk through parts of the city and it's relatively quiet, obviously, until they encounter certain infected. Uh, it's not quite what she was expecting. But the key part here that I'm getting at is that she brings up like oh wait so there's not like big giant ones that shoot out spores uh which you know that might be coming at some point but uh there's not one that can split its head in half and that one i didn't recognize and it sounds like yeah okay there's some rumors of it there's some extreme kinds of infected that there's bigger kinds there's more uh, monstrous and mutated kinds of infected um and I think the clicker, you know, is the payoff to that in this episode. It sets it up with her asking those questions, and then she doesn't know what they're talking about. She doesn't know what they're scared of when they get into the museum. I mean, she can probably make some wild guesses, but clearly she's never seen a clicker. Clearly this is something that's new to her. Where's 
Joel and Tess immediately are terrified and are like, we have to take this extremely seriously. So I love the build up to it there. Um, there's so many moments that evoke the video game, like crouching down behind like a <laughs> like the the cover in the museum and try to sneak around the clicker and being quiet. Uh, it's got that sort of don't breathe quality or whatever, you know, the, you know, stepping on glass, making a bit of noise, Ellie breathing, making a bit of noise, being that, that pin drop moment where the clickers know they're there. So it becomes this intense chase. So it's quiet, intense, and then it becomes intense when the noise happens and they start running at them. Uh, really, really quite good. Uh, so uh, all, all that stuff was great. The set design, again, it was very reminiscent of the game in that section, but feeling like it was all designed for the show and for the the scene it was in rather than just being a nothing but easter eggs uh, and that's been the key to the adaptation so far is that it's adding smart things to enhance the story and taking out things that shouldn't be in a, a tv show because it's just it would be repetitive or it would, you know or, or whatever you know a simple thing here because uh, i don't remember this being in the game but ellie gets better here again and she's like, oh, well, if it was going to happen to one of us, it might as well be me since I'm kind of immune. Uh, or, in theory, she's immune. Uh, it's maybe not a certainty, but that seems to be the case. Uh, so I, I don't remember that being in the game that moment, but it, it gave me a little uh, chuckle. Um, so shout out. One of the things I said that this, this adaptation has not completed properly until it does. There was a few things that I need to see throughout this show. I don't know if I said this in the first review, but I'll reiterate them here. Uh, and one of them happened in this episode, and that was uh, someone get given a boost. Joel gives Tess a boost when they're trying to like get around to the, the locked door, and it leaves him alone with Ellie for a little minute. He gives Tess a boost. That's important. <laughs> that happens a lot in the game. Uh, what I also need to see now is pushing of a dumpster or a similar type of object to claim onto you know, a fire escape or wherever it may be. Um... Uh, or possibly uh, blocking a door with some... But what actually, that kind of happened this episode, because at the start, uh, after they have their conversation, Joel removes, like, a bookcase or something from the door of the, the store that they're hiding in. So I guess that's already kind of happened. So yeah, fair enough. They've, they've crossed that off the list. Uh, and these aren't important things. They're just little silly things that I think of when playing the game, because you do them a lot, that I feel like I need to see them all once <laughs> in the TV show. Just, just to feel like I got the... The Phil experience of The Last of Us. Um, so, I'm going to talk about my favorite line of dialogue in this whole episode, and it comes quite early on. Uh, so, we have the sort of the proper reaction now to Ellie having a bite and being infected, but clearly it seems to be okay. And the, she wakes up in the morning, uh, she's in like a fetal position, it's very, you know. Yeah, but it looks like she's like the way the camera sort of was looking down at her in the uh, in the moss or whatever it is inside the in the building. It, it was it's very childlike, and both Tess and, and Joel are just sitting there with their guns pointed at her. Or at least Joel is. I mean, but they're both concerned. They're both like watching her like a hawk, and she survived a night without being infected, which to them is like unheard of. Like within a day, that's when it usually happens, and she's already you know. They've already heard that she's, this was weeks ago, but now they've spent the amount of time with her that it normally happens in. So they're starting to maybe, or at least Tess is starting to believe. Joel's very um, sceptical. Um, but the line that stuck out to me is when Ellie goes off to, uh, to use the bathroom. The line that stuck out to me here that I thought was, uh, was great was, you know, Tess is starting to be convinced and she's saying, hey, like, she's not turned yet or something to that effect. Joel's line really stuck out to me where he says it doesn't matter it'll happen eventually you know it doesn't matter if it's now or later it's eventually going to happen you know he said something to that effect that it's eventually going to happen and I couldn't help but immediately just think about how this this is really about him not wanting to get close to someone because his daughter died and he feels that anyone he cares about will eventually be taken away from him in some way and that's beautiful setup for the rest of this episode because this episode ends with someone that he in theory cares about being taken away in the form of Tess. Uh, there's a lot of good like setup and payoff. Uh, there was some of it in the first episode. This episode has like a few things like that. Uh, this here, where him, you know, the, su the subtext of him not wanting to get close to someone because they're going to be taken away. 
um, and trying to like not let himself get attached. That comes up with directly with Tess because at the end, when it's clear she's like infected and going to die, um, she has a line where she says, uh, you know, I've never asked for much. I've never asked you to feel the same things I felt, which clearly implies that, well, this is kind of a, a relationship of sorts. She's been more open and pursued it or felt more than he has, that he is in some way tried to not let himself become attached to her, to not fall in love, to not really truly care, to try and keep her at a distance because he doesn't want to feel any more pain. And something that's, that he's probably been like ever since his daughter died. That even this person who seems like the one who's closest to him right now, um, like, it, you know, it, that line said so much about their history and relationship. Um, as did like her reaction to a lot of what he says in this episode, where he's, you know, he repeatedly in this episode is being very skeptical, and she kind of gets pissed at him a couple times for just being so cynical. Like, hey, maybe we can actually win this time. Maybe we can actually do this. And I thought that was really good character setup, uh, or just really good little nuggets of information that really kind of gave painted a picture of what their relationship was. Now, it's not out of the question we'll get a flashback, especially if every episode is going to open with one. Maybe we'll get one you know, what actually has Joel and Tess in it from before the, the start of the main part of the story. We, we could get that later in the season. Um, in fact, uh, the second game, and not to spoil anything, but the second game has a bit of a time jump and there's a lot of uh, flashbacks in the second game to between the two games. I could see them, like, being the flashbacks at the start of the episodes in season two, potentially. Maybe not. I, I, I don't know. They may not need to do that. But I, I could see that being a thing. Uh, but like it just it paints such a picture of what these two are liked with each other and particularly how Joel is with Tess and potentially will be with Ellie and that he is determined to not let himself get attached to someone because he's too scared of someone being taken away from him and it's obviously it's not like he's actually you know we're still so early on in the Joel and Ellie relationship it's not like he's even pondering the idea that maybe he is attached to Ellie yet, but there is some great little chemistry moments in this episode where, you know, she's asking him questions about his past, and he doesn't want to tell her anything. Again, showing that he is he is withholding, that he is trying to keep his distance, uh, all, all that stuff. But there's little moments where, you know, he helps her up, and has a, a little sort of moment of weirdness about it, because he, he was just scared of her bite, at, you know, in all the scenes up, up until that point, but he's just put out his hand to help her um you know he has to check on her he, he's you know there's a point where she's ellie kind of teases how she got bit and they talk about it and it kind of feels like she's beholding information it feels like she's um not telling the truth uh it's particularly and this is weird to talk about because like i know things <laughs> because i've played the game and i've played the dlc which was the story of how she got bit um, but I think even in the scene, I think it's pretty clear that she is leaving out details, that she is withholding certain things. But, you know, Tess is impressed with her. She says she's got balls. Um, and that's something that, that Joel is with. At this point in the story, Joel wouldn't dare give her like a compliment or anything. You know, he says she has a nice knife, I think, maybe, kind of. But that's not really complimenting her. You know, he's not trying to bond or build an attachment. And I, I think that's set up repeatedly throughout this episode um to a tragic point where when he has to leave Tess at the end and it's the right thing to do and she wants him to do it and she's going to like you know like hold off the the infected and give them a chance to get away so they won't follow um it's this tragic thing where he leaves her k k kind of like you know like the way he was with her and everything she said about him was true and he never gets a chance to fix that and the only thing he can do for her is the one request which is to get Ellie to Bill and Frank and, you know, hopefully continue that journey because the fireflies that were supposed to take on Ellie here are, of course, dead already. And Tess at least is believing that Ellie could make a difference, that, you know, her immunity could lead to some sort of cure. If there's even a chance that this could be a good thing, then, like, they have to take it. And that's what she wants Joel to promise. She wants Joel to promise that he'll try and, you know, not necessarily finish the mission per se. This is not him committing to, like, you know everything that possibly might go down this this is just like get her to the next stage so that she's got a chance and the fireflies can do what they're going to do um so obviously this ending is very tragic obviously the, the 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 weird kiss that happens with the the squidlies oh that was disgusting um 
That, that was that was an interesting direction. It was this at first I thought they were ignoring her because she was infected, and then I kind of thought, um, once one of them does notice, it was kind of interesting. I think I saw something. Uh, I, I I've barely looked to see what anyone else thought of this episode, but the one thing I did see is there was a comment from uh, one of the creators about how this is kind of like what happens if the person who's getting attacked by the infected isn't resisting. This is more of like a, like she's just kind of letting it happen. So it's almost more of like a sensual kiss. A disgusting sensual kiss with the squigglies, but uh, that's kind of kind of what it is. But uh, so, no, so like I say, all of this stuff does such a great job of like, kind of teasing and hinting at the relationship between Tess and Joel. It really paints a picture and in turn also sets you up for how withholding Joel himself is and how much he's going to like fight feeling anything for Ellie even though like they're going through this trauma and naturally there will be some kind of camaraderie. And to, to a kind of a similar extent Ellie as well kind of masks anything she's feeling with with jokes, with with uh, sarcasm, with you know snappy, you know swearing and stuff. Like she she is constantly, and she's got some funny lines in this. You know when she doesn't get a gun, she says, uh, "I'll just throw my sandwich at them," which was also a funny little moment. Was like she has this really nice looking sandwich, and <laughs> Joel and Tess have like jerky or something. It just looks like shit. <laughs> That she's got this nice proper like sandwich that looks like you might have got in a restaurant or something. So yeah, really strong character work. Like I really engrossing in the way that it's it's it, setting up the faults of the characters. And like I'm saying, you know, Ellie seemingly also is resistant to forming bonds. Also because she's maybe lost people. You know, she brings up that she's an orphan. Maybe she has attachment issues herself. So the idea that both characters are going to be resisting with every fiber of their being to form any kind of bond. Um, but naturally, Ellie being the kid might be the one to, like, give in first. Like, she's the one who, even if she won't admit it, does want to feel some sense of, like, like guardian or protection or someone she can count on. Whereas Jade, na- uh, J- Jade, <laughs> Joel, naturally being much older, and jaded, that's why I said Jade, because he's jaded and he's cynical and he's lost so much. He naturally is going to be more resistant to it. And I think the idea of that breaking down and having these moments, uh, and there's a couple of little shots in this where they're standing next to each other and they're looking out at the city, uh, where Ellie says, look, you know, you can't beat that view. And that's a line from the video game. And he just kind of gives her this look. And it's almost like there's just little bits of her humor that, you know, she's not exactly like her, his daughter was, you know, not exactly like Sarah. And she never will be. She's a different person. But some of that fire, because, you know, Sarah did crack jokes. Sarah was quite witty with her dad. And I think there's just little slithers that, of recognition. Uh, I think at one point in the episode, Joel even looks at his watch because he, he thinks of Sarah. And those little moments just go a long way to really kind of already establishing that there's some chemistry between these two characters. And, like... And then, you know, to go back to Tess for a second, like, her, she, it seems like she wants redemption. You know, she says throughout this episode that her and Joel are not good people. And at the end of the episode, it's like, hey, maybe you can do one good thing. Save who you can save. You know, that was the line she has at the end of the episode. Um, she also has a uh, shut the F up because I don't have much time. Because <laughs> he wants to respond to some of the things she said that I've already brought up. And she's like, no, I don't have time. I'm, I'm going to be turning soon. Like, I need to do this. I need to make my big speech and convince you to piss off and try and save the girl so all that stuff i thought was excellent um it was you know taking a lot from the game adding more into it and just really building this idea of who these two main characters are and i'm sure for new people who maybe don't know the story of the game maybe you were thinking that tess was going to be a a bigger character or more of a longer running i think it's a testament that they made her feel so important in the first two episodes to kind of really motivate Joel's character and journey, but fundamentally she is there to set up who Joel is, and that's the important part. So, uh, that was really well handled. Uh, is it, going back to the idea that this episode does a really great job of setting things up that are paid off later, um, you had, of course, the introduction of the idea that there's uh, connections between some of the infected. You have these... Um, you know, f- what, fungal lines, the network. Uh, I, w- I want to say the thing from Star Trek Discovery because I had like the the mycelial network <laughs> that they always brought up. Uh, but the idea being that if you step on like a, an infected uh, squig- squiggly somewhere, 
that it could be connected to something as much as a mail away, uh, Joel says. And early on in the episode, they chose their route based on the fact that they see this big group of infected um, on the ground. And so when they step on a thing, when, they, when they're when they in the, the, the building at the end and they, they shoot uh, an infected that wakes up, they see the squiggly moving and Joel just knows, oh, they're going to be coming. And sure enough, we see them all get up. So it sets that up and it pays it off later um, that we, we understand this threat, which is actually a change from the, the, the game in that in the game, when they flee this building and Tess stays back to hold off the enemy, the enemy isn't actually the infected. If I remember correctly, it's Fedra. It's the... Uh, you know, the government, if you will, uh, the soldiers that are coming after them at this point in the episode, or in the in the game. So that, that was a bit of a change, but it made a lot of sense in this episode, because we haven't really had a lot of the running around infected yet, you know, the... Because um, that was another little detail they brought up in this episode, at least in the, the show, uh, the idea that the regular infected, you know, the ones that are running around and have the squigglies in their mouths, most of them don't survive that long. Uh, I think Joel says they only survive a few months, most of them. But some of them evolve into the clickers, presumably. You know, they, 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 they evolve into the next stage. So that's why there's not tons of clickers, because only a percentage will evolve into that. And then maybe an even smaller percentage will maybe evolve into some other things that we may see. So I thought that was a really interesting little tidbit to set up um, the numbers and like why certain amounts of, of various infected exist. I, I thought all these were, these were all really smart little changes, I, I thought, to the mythology to make it work in the context of a TV show where there isn't thousands like constantly for you to fight. Because in a video game, you, you need to be constantly in combat or in stealth or in, you know engaging in gameplay where you're getting around enemies. TV show's a bit different. So... Um, obviously, you know, I'm excited to see the, the Bill and Frank stuff because I know that section of the game, so I'm excited for uh, the next episode, which I assume that will be the prim primary part of it. Um, obviously, I have to go back and talk about that opening of the episode in Jakarta. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really well handled. It's, it's setting up this, this serious uh, kind of, you know, this scientist, this woman's like coming... Not arrested per se, but you know the they come and like pick her up in a cafe where she's having her lunch, and she's got no choice but to go with them. And it's all you know, it's very much like in a like a disaster movie when they go and get the the scientist who will know, who's the expert in the thing that's maybe about to destroy the earth. It, it felt very much like that, but it had a very serious tone to it. And she examines this dead body. But the real, honestly, the, the best part of the whole thing was the final scene, uh, the final part of it, which was, she's asking, okay, this woman that I just studied, uh, where did she come from? And it's like, oh, she became violent at her work, and there's 14 other members of, of the staff who are missing, and she's like, okay, but who bit her? How, you know, just if she's patient, patient zero in the work that spread to other people in the building, where did it come from? And when the... The military guy can't tell her. He doesn't know. They have no idea. He's like, what do we do? And she's like, because of what this is, you know, and, you know, this was set up in the opening scene of the last episode, you know, and I, I can't explain it that well because I'm, <laughs> I'm not an expert in this, but because it's not like a, a virus in the same way that, you know, like, you know, we just had a pandemic, for example. It's not like that. Uh, because this is based on this particular type of spread that happens in the insect world, um, she's like, you can't stop this. There is no vaccine for this. There is no cure for this. Um, her recommendation, and she gets very emotional. And I think it's, they did a good job of getting like a good actor to do this because this is an actor we're probably never going to see again in this show. So it's a big ask. And same with John Hanna last time. It's a big ask to get like a big name or I mean, this isn't even a big name necessarily, but just uh, a really strong actor to really sell it and give the gravitas it needs for this like one little almost short movie is building the larger world. But when she just immediately goes to, you have to bomb the city. And it's not like she's saying, can I get out first? She, she says she wants to go and be with her family. She's kind of accepting that she's going to be within the people that are bombed, but this can't spread. Um, and that also sets up things because later on, uh, we see like how bad like Boston is. And they mentioned that, you know, it was bombed and it was bombed to try and stop the spread. Uh, so again, a little bit set up and then a little bit uh, further payoff uh, down the line. So all very, very good stuff. Um, yeah, the episode was excellent. I mean, if that wasn't obvious. 
<laughs> if that wasn't obvious at this point, I mean, obviously it looks great, like, it feels very big budget. I'm not going to say that I never, like, felt a little bit of the, you know, like, the, they're out in the, the city that's all destroyed and stuff. Yeah, occasionally, like, if you're really, really looking for it, you can get a, a little bit of that, you know, green screen or CG feel if you, if you, you know, you're, you're, the composites, like, but by and large, it looks very high quality, and it feels like a lot of money went into it, and it feels like a prestige show, as it should, because that's what you think of when you think of a HBO show. Uh, so all that's looked great. Um, you know, them get into the museum, and they had the fung- fungus stuff all over the walls, and, you know, just... It's done a really good job of, like, hinting at, like, the mythology of everything with just little moments and lines simple little things like checking to see if the the fungus is dry and crumbles because that would suggest that maybe the enemies aren't there anymore that it's not you know it's not i assume if there's enemies active even though it turned out there was clickers but at least they expect it to be i don't know fresher <laughs> juicier perhaps maybe a better word uh but it's this dry it crumbles it's it's not very you know fresh and as a result they think oh maybe it's safe it might be safe uh, and then they even tease the clicker with the body that's all slashed to hell, and Ellie's like, wait a minute, I was attacked by an affected person, and it looked nothing like that. Also very good. So, no. Um, but I, I thought, like, all of the uh, the character, like, chemistry, the interactions between the characters was really solid. And of course, most importantly, between Joel and Ellie. And all of that was great. Ellie had a lot of little great lines that, that, that popped me. You know, throw the sandwich at you. Um... You know, I, I like I, I go to school. I know where Detroit is, but the school's not that good. You know, just, there was a lot of little funny lines from Ellie that gave your personality. Um, and obviously, as far as visuals from the games go, I mentioned all the stuff in the museum with the clickers and whatnot, which felt very authentic. And the fact that I was really surprised actually that they started off with two clickers. It felt like starting with one clicker is just the sort of thing that a a movie or a TV show would do. But I kind of loved that they started with two because it's very reminiscent of the first time or a lot of the early encounters in the game. Maybe not the very first time, but you often do get more than one clicker and it kind of made it more intense to have two of them there. So that was really good. Um, Yeah. Uh, And then even Tess just using the infected thing to like prove like, hey, look at my bite. My bite's like 15 minutes old and I am like all veiny and disgusting and Ellie's bite's not even mutating at all. Like, clearly this is real. She's actually immune, whatever. Uh, but other visuals, you know, the the, the little walkway bridge um, going from building to building after the museum, uh, that, that felt very much like a visual from the game. I think in the game, like, maybe they have to put down, like, a, a plank to walk across, so it's not just something that's already there, maybe, if I recall. Maybe I'm mixing it up with another part, but regardless, it still looked very similar. Like, them walking across um, and looking out the city. Uh, all very nice. Like so far, they're making very smart decisions over which parts to to keep. Because there, you know, there's a building they go through in the game before the museum where they actually encounter the first clicker. And in the video game or in the TV show, they don't do that. They save it for the museum, which is a bigger encounter that comes after. And it's the more important one because it's the one where Tess gets infected. You don't see it, of course. It happens off camera, and you think she's okay for a bit. But uh, that that's you know they've they've chosen wisely. Uh, in those cases so um no uh, as an adaptation it's still very riveting i love seeing all the little details that they're adding or changing uh because they all feel like they're being made with very wise choices in place and that doesn't surprise me because you know craig mazin who's the co-showrunner on this um worked on chernobyl and that also changed things from history you know that was that wasn't adapting a book or whatever it was adapting real life but the changes were made to make it function really well as a piece of you know visual media to to make it work as a piece of narrative and i think this is just kind of it makes sense that those skills are transferable where if he was able to do it with a real life event and make it all work like keep the integrity of it like don't you know chernobyl's still very effective at like making you realize how scary that situation was and what a lot of the real mistakes and decisions being made that were going into making it worse I think this similarly is taking all of the important parts and it's making sure they're all emphasized and it's making sure they all feel equally as important to the game. But it's reshaping a couple of little things and it's doing these little differences to to make it work in this medium. And uh, that that's become especially apparent after episode two. I think episode one, you know, it was there too. But episode one, because it was mostly adapting the first, you know, chunk of the game, which is 
naturally a lot more just straight story in the first place. You know, when you play a video game that's got a lot of story, you tend to find that the first hour or two has a lot more cutscenes. So it's a lot more like a TV show, the first couple hours of a video game. That has a lot of story. Certainly The Last of Us kind of is. Because it's not a lot, you know, a lot of the gameplay where you're fighting enemies and you're dodging clickers and all that stuff, that doesn't come for a few hours. The first couple hours is the introduction to the door. It's the, you might get to walk around a little bit, but it's mostly characters talking. It's mostly events happening that you're not interacting with too much. And as a result of that, I think the first episode felt a lot more, you know, they added more stuff, but it was a lot more one-to-one. I think this episode is very interesting in that it's getting into the real like gameplay part of the game and adapting those parts where um, you can't just do it one-to-one because it would be weird and repetitious. So it's really fascinating to see how they do it now. Um, and now this is already kind of the pinnacle of like how you adapt a, a video game at this point. Number one's taking it seriously, num- but number two through the next 20 numbers is all these little decisions and choosing what to keep, what not to keep, and all the rest of it. And on top of that, it's just extremely well-directed, and the actors are still doing a phenomenal job. Um, Like I say, those little looks that Joel was giving, or Pedro Pascal, I should say, when he's reacting to stuff that Ellie's saying, when he's holding back, at the end, when he's reacting to to Tess, all of it just added to the, the character building that the show's doing. So... Excellent. So it's working on character and drama level because it's setting up the two main characters really well and they're performed excellently. And then the actual clickers and horror stuff and just the production value of like seeing the world is all being nailed. There's very little to fault, honestly. Very little to fault. So that is my thoughts on episode two of The Last of Us. Hopefully you enjoyed hearing me ramble for half an hour. Uh, let me know what you thought of the, the the episode in the comments below, and you can like, subscribe, and ding the bell for notifications. You can support all the content by going over to patreon.com slash TV or hit the super thanks button as a one-time thing if you want to. Uh, but any all support is appreciated. Helps keep all the content coming. Thank you very much for joining me. I will see you in next time. Cannot wait for episode three. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla.